Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Good morning. I'm Chris Morris, the pastor of Christ Divine Lutheran Church here in Damascus, Oregon. And we are here, though we're gathering online, we're still gathering to receive the gifts of God. And we gather in the name that was first pronounced over us at our baptisms. We're gathering in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> third Sunday in the season of Easter, our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. This is the story of Jesus and the two disciples of his on the road to Emmaus. Let's read. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we walked while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, 
The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Last week, we read how the frightened followers of Jesus hid on Easter Sunday evening from the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities, in a locked room somewhere in Jerusalem. When Jesus suddenly appeared in their midst, they were flabbergasted, stunned. One of the apostles, Thomas, wasn't there when Jesus appeared. And Thomas announced that he didn't believe Jesus had risen and wouldn't believe until he saw Jesus himself. Eight days later, Thomas got his chance when Jesus appeared to the apostles again. The primary point of that event is that Jesus' resurrection from the dead is a historical fact. It's not a myth intended to serve as some kind of allegory. The point is not that Jesus rose from the dead in my heart. The point is that Jesus actually physically rose from the dead. Today's gospel lesson tells the story of another incident that happened on that first Easter Sunday. But this story makes a different point. The striking thing about the narrative of the disciples on the road to Emmaus is the intense grief and loss and utter disappointment they just experienced. They were in Jerusalem just a week earlier when Jesus entered the city to the shouts of the huge Palm Sunday crowd who greeted him. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, a reference to the Messiah. All his followers fully expected that Jesus would soon be crowned the new earthly king of Israel. And yet the very opposite happened. He was tortured and beaten and crucified like a common criminal. His only crown was a crown of thorns. Those closest to him had fully expected that Jesus, as the new king of Israel, would ensure their success. As members of Jesus' inner circle, they'd be rewarded with positions of honor and glory and wealth. But it was all a mirage, apparently, dust in the wind. And the followers of Jesus were left to cope with their own bitter disappointment and the overwhelming sense of loss and the grief that comes with the death of someone deeply loved. The thing that resonates about this narrative is that we all suffer grief and loss and pain and bitter disappointment. We live in a fallen world filled with tragedy. We're also sinful human beings prone to do stupid, selfish things. Sometimes we're victims of tragedy. Sometimes we bring it on, it on ourselves, but we all experience tragedy. Those disciples on the road to Emmaus were reeling, rocked with grief and in a state of shock. That's why they were so enamored with the man that joined them on that road. Jesus addressed their grief by giving meaning and purpose to the tragic events they'd experienced. You know, it's an outrageous idea that God takes our tragedies and redeems them into something positive, something far better than we could imagine. It's strange, especially when you're in the depths of anguish and pain and fear. But that's what God has done in Christ. He's created good out of bad, victory out of defeat. He's created life out of death. And that's what's promised to us throughout Scripture. There's something else very important that Jesus did with these disciples. He didn't just address their grief, their individual pain. 
He included them. He drew them in as participants in the bigger story of God redeeming all of mankind from sin. I won't repeat the story now, but a few years ago, I mentioned the tragedy of my dad's early life, the disintegration of his family and his abandonment. And I told the story of his friend, Paul Wangsmo, from a Norwegian immigrant family who made a point to include my dad by taking him to church. As a result, throughout his life, my dad clung to God. When my dad died several years ago, his classmate and close friend, Paul Wangsmo, had died a few years earlier. They drifted apart over the years until the last year of Paul's life, when my dad went to visit him every week. When my dad died, I wrote to Paul's sister, explaining how my dad told me the story of her family bringing him to church when he was a kid. I told her about his confidence in his last days, that he was going to heaven, and how important his faith and his church had always been to him, and that I was now a Lutheran pastor. I wanted to make this point. My dad had become a participant in her family's story, and so had I, though I'd never met them. And they had become participants in our story. The point of the Emmaus story is that we're participants in a bigger story. That's why Jesus gave those disciples something that marked them as participants in the biggest story there is the story of God's forgiveness and redemption of mankind. Jesus gave them his body and his blood. He gave them communion. Communion is not for those who've overcome their sin problem and no longer need the assurance of God's forgiveness and love. It's for those of us who recognize that despite our best efforts, we harbor anger and pride and envy and lust and greed and all kinds of stuff. It's for us who are overwhelmed at times by the ugliness inside of us. It's for us who long for God's accepting, forgiving embrace. It's for us who are sometimes overwhelmed with the sadness of life. It's for us who are desperate for the assurance of God's love. Communion is not for those who revel in the progress they've made at eliminating particular sins in their lives. Instead, it's for us who recognize that sin is a condition that we're afflicted with. Us who recognize our never ending need for God's forgiveness and mercy. Communion is for us participants, participants in the story of God redeeming humanity, redeeming you. In his word and in his sacraments, God pours down his mercy on those of us unworthy of his mercy. So for you who are exhausted and desperate and despairing, for you who are grieving and sad and lost. Communion is for you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
let's take a few minutes to pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love and compassion and mercy toward us. Lord, help us to respond to your great love for us by loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving one another and all our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give to all people peace. And Lord, we pray that you would preserve our land from strife, that you would give our country your protection in every time of need. Lord, we pray that you would defend our leaders and protect them and all those who are in authority. Lord, we pray that you would watch over and help all people who are in danger and all of those who are in need and all those who are impoverished, and all those who are sick, and all those who are in prison, and all those who are afraid and who are grieving and who are despondent. Lord, we ask that you would pour your love and mercy upon all these people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we also pray that you would strengthen and keep all who are sick. Lord, we pray that you would protect our children. And Lord, we pray that you would free those who are in bondage and that you would have mercy on us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we also ask that you would help us to do what you have asked of us. Lord, help us even to forgive our enemies, those who persecute us and slander us. Lord, help us to do what you have asked us to do and demanded of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love for us and your compassion toward us. Lord, we pray especially today for Katie Leddington uh, as she recovers from illness. Lord, comfort her and heal her. Lord, we pray for Leslie Spies, uh, diagnosed with cancer and uh, uh, just coming out of cancer surgery. Lord, we thank you for the successful surgery that she's experienced. Lord, we ask that you restore her health and strengthen her. Lord, we pray for a little four-year-old Tatum, uh, the, the niece of... Uh, of Julie Lutz, uh, or the, the daughter of her cousin. Lord, please be with little four-year-old Tatum as she has been diagnosed with cancer. Lord, we ask that you would have mercy on Tatum and mercy on her parents and her family, and that you would heal her. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we also pray for Diane Mather, uh, who uh, is grieving in the wake of her sister's death her sister Pam. Lord, please be with Diane and be with the whole family. Be with Pam's husband, especially. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we also pray for a young man recently out of prison. Lord, we ask that you would ease his anxiety, that you would give him peace, and that you would give him confidence that all is going to work out in his life, and that he is capable of fitting in and reintegrating with society. Lord, please be with, with that young man. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your love toward us, your people, and we pray in the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you for joining us this third Sunday in the season of Easter. The last thing that I have to say is this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. with Splash and Steam, the show where we show you some nice and easy recipes that you can make right at home. I'm Splash. Ick a fork to spark dork. Um, Steam, what are you doing? It's to flork a cork. <laughs> um, Steam, you aren't Swedish. Stop it. Oh, um, sorry, I was just, just trying to get in the right headspace. All right, Steam, uh, what are we making today? Hmm, uh, I don't know. What are we making? Uh, you're the one who brought the ingredients. I thought you had something in mind. Um, well, I thought we were making food, so I brought stuff to make food. Today, we will be making food! Alright, let's see here. Um, what do we have? We have eggs, we have flour, milk, chocolate. Um, I don't know what this thing is. Um, sugar. Oh, and some other stuff. I, I think I know what we can make. Cookies? Soffle. Wait, what? Soffle. Are, are you trying to say souffle? It's soffle. Today, we are going to make a yummy chocolate soffle. Um, but Splash, I don't know how to make soffle or even get a souffle. Ah, uh, don't worry. I'm pretty sure it, it's easy to do. Um, can't be too hard to figure out. Five minutes later. Oh, oh my! Uh, what happened? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe, maybe we blew it up. Does that look right to you? Um, I'm not sure what it's supposed to look like. Pretty sure it's burnt. Well, let's try it anyways. Maybe it'll be good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Well, at least I know why it's called Sawful, because it's awful. Yeah. Hey, Steam and Flash, are you guys ready for a Bible story? Steam, Flash, what happened? Why does it look like something blew up in here? Uh, hey, Mrs. Georgie, um, sorry about the mess. We just, uh, well, we were just trying to do something productive. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to make a uh, kitchen show where we could help teach people how to make Sawful. Soffle? Uh, do you mean souffle? Well, it doesn't matter now because it's a soon mess now. Oh, well, did you guys follow the recipe? Uh, recipe? Um, uh, well, we didn't look at a recipe. Oh, man. Now I'm just sad and confused. Well, guys, you know, even if you think you know a lot about something, it never hurts to look it up. You know, double check. And that's kind of what our Bible story is about today. Wait, someone thought they could make an 18th century French dessert? <laughs> wow, those chefs in the Bible were really ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. No, but there were some men who thought that they knew enough about the Bible and the scriptures, but they ended up kind of sad and confused too. You know, here, let me open up my Bible. Okay. 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 So Jesus had risen from the dead, 
and there were these two men on their way to a place called Emmaus. And on their way there, they were talking about what had happened to Jesus. Mm. And then Jesus came and started to talk with them. Oh, I bet they were excited. Yeah, yeah. Well, not actually. They didn't know that it was Jesus. They were kept from recognizing him. Mm. And they didn't even know that Jesus had already risen from the dead. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Well, it wasn't until Jesus shared what the Bible said about him, and then he broke bread with them, that, he, that they finally realized that he was Jesus. Oh, wow. That must have been some good bread. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't the bread that helped them to see. It was Jesus. They thought that they knew the old scriptures. But much like how you thought you knew how to make a souffle, Jesus was the one that showed them that they should have read the scriptures. Oh, so the traveling men didn't understand everything until Jesus told them? Um, yeah. The disciples realized that when Jesus talked about the scriptures, they should have known that it was all about him. Just like when we read the Bible, we understand more about how God loves us. Hmm. Yeah, sort of like reading the recipe helps us understand how to um, bake stuff. And if you don't, you end up making softball. But I now realize how important it is for me to read the Bible myself. Yeah, yeah you know, I I'm going to go read my Bible right now. Uh, no guys, you're going to clean this up first. Oh man. Softball. But, but Splash, I don't know how to make a softball. Uh, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we really screwed up now. <laughs>